I've created and I've never been to business school. Uh, in fact, I've only taken two courses in college. I have no degree uh, in business, in journalism, in activism, uh, what have you. I've sort of found my way along the way. Uh, but our business role model is to specifically print news that we own. So therefore, marriage equality story that's a nationwide story isn't going to be on the front page of my newspaper. Um, uh, a hate crime that happens in Philadelphia, that's going to be on the front page of my newspaper. If someone's being discriminated against, that's going to be on the front page. Anything that happens locally, local news, local, local, local. Um, you know, you can go to a million places on the web and find out anything about marriage equality. You can go to a million places on the web and find out anything you want about a gazillion area. But it, I would suggest to you that you should Google Nyes and Mars. Um, which is the uh, famous uh, trans uh, death story, I'll call it, uh, that we've been chronicling now for the last 11 years, uh, that we specifically own. Uh, Nigel Mars was a trans person who uh, late at night was given a courtesy ride home by the Philadelphia police. She uh, was then found dead on her doorstep about an hour later. We've been investigating that story now for 11 years. Um, and last year, we won the National um, Society of Professional Journalist Award um, for investigative reporting, along with the Wall Street Journal. Uh, no LGBT publications ever won such an esteemed award before. And I wrote a column about it, which was, since we won this big award, it's a big award of night, we're at the Washington Press Club, and so half the table is members of PGN. The other half of the table were people from the Wall Street Journal. And so my column that week was called, uh, Sex Talk with the Wall Street Journal. Hmm. Um, let's see, um, well also, in terms of the, the media, how do you feel the non-gay media is doing in covering our community and our issues? I think they were getting better, but the uh, traditional media has a problem. Its problem is that they're shrinking. And as they shrink, they're shrinking, unfortunately, the wrong side of their newspapers. Rather than take, lay off people from the business end of their newspapers, they're laying off journalists. As they lay off journalists, journalists who are familiar with the LGBT community um, are let go, and therefore, their expertise isn't there. So when something happens in Philadelphia, in the LGBT community, the first place traditional media call is our office. And they go, gee, can you tell us uh, a gay couple that are, just got married that we can talk to? Gee, can you find us someone in the military who just was allowed to join the military? They have no connections. We're their first call. Um, and we sometimes help them, sometimes don't. It's a great story. We're not going to help them. We want to print it first. Um, and we do. I mean, we find ourselves that when there's a court case now that would be important to the city, uh, there's no reporters there from traditional media. We're the only reporters there because they have few reporters. It's kind of sad. Um, given your long history of activism, I have a two-part question. Um, what are the most important lessons you feel like you've learned through your career of activism, about activism? And uh, which of those lessons do you think are applicable today? Do some of them have to be maybe tweaked or laid aside? Uh, the answer to the first one is really easy. I'm still learning. You know, um, I feel like sort of when I when, when I said to John, I don't want to publish it after I read the first full version. The reason for that was I said um, no one's going to believe that any one person did all these things. That was my reaction to it. And so what I realized was that I'm a sort of a chameleon. I change over the course of life. I mean, uh, the one constant is that I'm a gay activist. You know, I have a lot of titles. There, all those titles to me are secondary. The developer of a senior building. Well, that's secondary to gay activists. I built the building because I wanted our activists to have a place to live. You know, founder of gay youth, I was a gay activist. I did that because, again, I wanted to help young gay people. Um, and each of them was done with a different sense, set of qualities. The qualities for gay youth was the gay activist around me and gay liberation from. Um, in order to get to the gay senior building, I had to know the governor, senators, um, even harass the president. You know, so it took a different skill set to do that. 
um, uh, the one thing that I would like people to take away from the book is how to learn to network and to realize that if you're young, when you meet someone today, don't make an enemy of that person because you might be able to use them 40 years from now. Um, even if you disagree with them, disagree with them um, respectfully and work with them if you can. I mean, one of the funniest things that ever happened to me, it's not in the book, unfortunately, is I mentioned that while I was doing the Elton John concert in Philadelphia, um, the entire city government was being investigated. And while they were doing this investigation of the city, um, they were also wiretapping the mayor and the senators and so forth in the city of Philadelphia. Well, I was emailing back and forth with the mayor of the city, who was John Street, who you mentioned. And during this time was where he was asking me questions. Well, what about if gay people do this? What about blah, blah, blah. And basically, I was trying to teach him, you know, how to accept us as a community. And so uh, one morning I woke up, and on the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer, how does a gay activist teach a mayor to, be, uh, to learn equality? And it was all the emails between me and the mayor. <coughs> you know, so there are different skill sets for each different thing you do. Um, and just don't be shocked when something you do, you know, is aired publicly. It's going to be. Yeah, yeah. Be transparent as you can be. Uh, to the movement going forward, what do you think of the potential pitfalls and high points of our movement going well, forward? I mean, there's, there's a cliche line now, which is you can get married today um, and tomorrow you'll be fired for being married in most of the United States because we don't have non-discrimination. That bill that Bella Abzug uh, talked to me about in 1974 still is not law. Isn't it amazing? We still, so, pitfalls. Um, to be very honest, there's a secondary reason I wanted that on the public, which was it's a message to young LGBT activists. You know, become creative again. Where's the creativity in our movement? Where is it? I don't see it. If I was that age again, um, and if I was uh, trying to get ENDA through Congress, um, Paul Ryan wouldn't have a free day. I'd find some way to harass that man every single day until he took, took our bill and put it out of committee. And that's what's wrong with our activists, especially in D.C. They're not doing that, and they should be doing that. I mean, there are people that are being discriminated across all across this country, and if we should be doing anything, that should be the number one objective at this point. Now, I'm sure because you're sort of beginning of my days as an activist, Wisconsin, where I live, was an early primary state, and other primaries, and a bunch of presidential candidates coming through there. So I tried to tackle as many as I could, you know. I found I put on a three-piece suit and carried a tape recorder. They think I was a reporter and talked to me. There is a picture in the book uh, of me in a suit and tie holding a sign saying gay power. Because I, what I did was I made the sign gay power on paper. I folded it and put it in my pocket and then snuck into a... Uh, Richard Nixon re-election dinner. <laughs> and that's the way I got in. And then I disrupted the dinner. And for that, I got denounced by the President of the United States. Something I'm very proud of, by the way. Okay, I think we're getting ready to have a question and answer period. So one more final question. Any thoughts about the presidential election season we're in the middle of right now, 2016? Besides your offer to work with uh, Mark Pink Carson. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just read a column which will come out this Thursday, um, which says that I am very alarmed by what's happening in the Republican primary system. Um, you have this guy who lives in your city by the name of Donald Trump. Oh, you got it. Are people actually listening to what this man has said? I mean, think about it. I have not heard this kind of rhetoric. In fact, I went to live last time this kind of rhetoric was done. It was done when a guy was running for chancellor in Germany. He was talking about literally taking a group of people, registering them, closing their businesses. Um, this was Hitler talking about Jews. We have a man now talking about Muslims in that same way. Um, and he also talked about Mexicans that way. I mean, this is scary, folks. And if you think a two-bit reality, reality TV star can't be elected president. We already elected an actor. 
I mean, come on, bud. Bad let's, actor. Yeah, bad actor. The actor. <laughs> um, so this, we have to start taking this serious. But and in my article, which I wrote on Sunday afternoon, I then turned on uh, my TiVo and watched uh, uh, Chuck Todd, who for the, became the first journalist to finally take on Trump. Uh, you know, and the man deserves credit. I had to rewrite the column, by the way, to include that. Um, but got to tell you, I was, I'm, I'm absolutely frightened by that. And I think people have to start. Uh, I mean, the man is supporting mob violence. A, a man went in, you know, uh, shouting about black lives, and the mob, in his, in his, while he was standing there, roughed the guy up. He not only did not say anything, the following day he said the guy might have deserved it. This doesn't remind you of 1938 Germany? Uh, I had a similar thought because I thought, well, you know, nobody, we, we could not elect Donald Trump. And I thought, well, we elected George Bush when he had Donald Quill, Dan Quill, okay, sorry, as his running man. You know, we were willing to have Dan Quill so I can be in the number two seat to become president, only a heartbeat away. So I don't say anything's possible, unfortunately. So. Yeah, anything's possible. 